Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Welcome to Hashing It Out, a podcast where we talk to the tech innovators behind blockchain infrastructure and decentralized networks. We dive into the weeds to get at why and how people build this technology and the problems they face along the way. Come listen and learn from the best in the business so you can join their ranks. guys episode 33 of hashing it out today is uh, an episode i think about a topic we've been trying to get for a long time but first as always colin couche hello colin hello colin hello colin hello colin yes uh, there our, you go. Okay, our, cool. our guest is... Nope, you're supposed to say say, so I'm actually doing nope. the commands. Like, nope. I'm parroting back. But, like, no, you didn't do that. You just wanted me to repeat it's what you said. It's extra meta, that way. It's... <laughs> Fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. All right. Our guest today is Georgios Constantopoulos. I hope I said that correctly this time. Plasma Research and Development at the Loom Network, which is a project that I admire quite a bit based on the work they're putting forward and some of, like, the brand new tech of the Ethereum Network. Um, why don't you say what's up? Tell us hey, like how you got thanks into for this having me. as well as like, yeah. um, what you do and what the Loom network is. Right. So in Loom, I'm uh, building a Plasma, a specific variant of Plasma called Plasma Cache. And we want to use it because um, we're building infrastructure, among other things, that involves uh, building scalable blockchains. And we believe that uh, Plasma is currently the best solution towards uh, trust-minimized scalable blockchains that are anchored to other blockchains for the, their security. And what the hell is a Plasma network? What is that? At like a 10,000-foot okay, so, view of Plasma for those right, who have been right, living right, under right. a rock. So uh, before getting into Plasma, maybe let's uh, discuss, let's give a brief overview of what a sidechain is. And then we can say about how Plasma builds on sidechains and what it improves. So I'll go with uh, sidechains is basically a technique which was uh, firstly proposed, I believe, in 2014 by Blockstream and others. And it involves the tactic of you lock up an asset on one blockchain and you have another blockchain which effectively verifies that you locked up an asset on the first one, which we call the main chain, if you will. And this means Whenever, when it verifies that the asset was locked on the main chain, it creates, it mints the same amount of that asset on the side chain. And you can use the asset in the side chain for as long as you want, for whatever you want. And when you want to withdraw the asset back to the original chain, what you're doing is that you burn the asset that you had on the side chain and you unlock the asset that you initially locked up in the main chain. So an easy way to think of it, it's, it's lock up, mint, burn, unlock. It's the two-step process that happens. This is a very nice process. It's very good to, to use it for interoperability so to, that we have two blockchains. We, I move an asset from Bitcoin to Ethereum. I conduct maybe a, an ICO on Ethereum with Bitcoin, which is two-way pegged. So any any Bitcoin that I put on Ethereum, it still, can, it still means that it is one Bitcoin, even though that it lives on Ethereum. However, it, has, it does not exactly complement towards scalability. Why? Because if we use, if we connect two blockchains that are individually secure, fine, it works. However, it doesn't work for scalability because if we use two proof of work blockchains, they're not exactly scalable. We want to go for something that's more scalable. Maybe proof of authority, maybe DPoS, maybe whatever you want. Maybe you want it to be, I don't know, some centralized database, doesn't matter. So what we do is that if you have a side chain which doesn't have a secure consensus algorithm, what can happen is that the side chain is a custodian of your funds. So if you have your side, if you have, if you move your funds on the side chain and the side chain decides to censor you and does not allow you to take your funds out, your funds are, are stuck. So we're trying to solve, to find a way to solve this. And this is where Plasma comes in. So in Plasma, essentially, even if you get censored, at any point in time, the side chain, the Plasma chain, we call it, 
makes commitments to the main chain about its state, and you can start a withdrawal of your asset to the main chain by specifying the latest valid state that you know is possible. So the main difference here is that Plasma is essentially a non-custodial sidechain because a normal sidechain is custodial in the sense that if it fails, your funds are gone. But in this case, your funds are safe at any time. Okay, that's a reasonably efficient 10,000 word view or 10,000 foot view of uh, what's going on here. Um, okay, so why has there been so many different names and changes and things going on across the plasma implementations over time? Is it is it because like you've run into issues you didn't know you'd have? Like, and if so, what are those issues? Or are, are there other things that have come into play as like the initial from the, from the initial white paper of uh, like Joseph Poon and Vitalik versus like what, where we're currently at now? Because those two things are very few and far between. Yeah. So let's just. To reframe that question, to get to the answer to that question, was what was the original proposal? Like, yeah, what, so what... here's story time, right? <laughs> so originally, uh, it's actually not that well known, but Vitalik had made a post in a blog, I think in blog.ethereum, where in 2014 or 2015, where he call, talks about the concept called shadow chains. Mm -hmm. And it's very similar to what was later pro pro proposed as Plasma in 2017. So what happened in the classic plasma, as we call it, it is that in the classic plasma paper from August with Joseph Poon and Vitalik, they write about, they lay out the vision, essentially, where you have a chain that makes commitments to the original chain and you leverage an exit game in order to withdraw your funds. And uh, you can also construct trees of chains, so a plasma chain of a plasma chain of a plasma chain, to potentially leverage infinite scalability, right? So this was the original thing. So currently, nothing that happens is related to the paper. Um, the <laughs> paper was very important in laying down the vision of what That's plasma hilarious. is. Yeah. So the thing is that it was it was very complex. It has uh, it has very useful building blocks for the mental model that we should approach. However, uh, things have evolved since then. So, uh, yeah, so what happened was that after a few months, uh, there was a post by Vitalik again on ETH research. So usually Vitalik is the one who starts the, he starts a ripple and then we see how it evolves. So what happened was that he wrote a post about plasma MVP, minimum viable plasma, which was essentially a UTXO based plasma chain, one level, just for payments, no smart contracts, no nested blockchains, like what the original paper was describing. I mean, it was a minimal viable product. And what it is, it's simply a two inputs, two outputs UTXO blockchain. And that's it. Uh, it's pretty simple. It's a design. And a few months later, uh, a, a first implementation came out by David Knott. And uh, that implementation eventually was built upon uh, on a concept called more viable plasma. And the issue was that the initial uh, plasma MVP, it had certain inefficiencies regarding the ways you were withdrawing your funds in case the consensus mechanism uh, of the plasma chain was malicious. And so the more viable plasma, it was an attempt, it is an attempt, it is a solution to these small issues. Um, there is one big problem though. The case is that all the you all these the, both of these plasma variants they in order to function safely they require a mechanism called mass exits why is that because um anytime the consensus mechanism of the side chain of the plasma chain it can simply make a huge exit so whenever i say exit i mean an attempt to withdraw your money from the plasma chain to to the mainnet and what uh, the plasma chain can do is that it can say, okay, I'm taking all the funds from the plasma chain and I'm exiting them to the mainnet. And this means that all users, they effectively need to exit their funds as well before the initial malicious exit happens. And this is what I mean by a mass exit. So every user needs to have in, to make their, enough transactions so that they get their funds out safely. And this happens because an exit, it has the so-called exit period, the dispute period. Mm -hmm. And so when I make an exit, 
I need to wait some days until I can finalize my exit, until my exit can be withdrawn. And uh, if my exit becomes challenged, so by challenge, we mean proof that, uh, we mean that some proof that contradicts the original statement. So I make an exit and the challenge cancels my exit. So you, all users effectively need to exit before the, before the, uh, the, count, the party that was trying to cheat. And currently, there is no efficient solution to mass exits because you would need to compress uh, information about 1 million UTXOs in a very small uh, amount of uh, data. We, all of this data, you need to put it to, chain, to the chain in order to verify to start the exit. And so, in uh, March of 2018, I think it was during the time of uh, ETHCC, the Ethereum Community Conference, what happened was that Vitalik uh, made a talk on a variant of Plasma, another variant of Plasma, called Plasma Cash. And so, by the way, this is the variant of Plasma that I have been working on for the last uh, few months. Okay, so let's rewind a little bit here, because our All audience right. is kind of a mixed background. So we have people from UX designers uh, to hardcore protocol engineers. Um, and um, some of them know what Plasma is very well, and some of them do not. So if I may, I'd like to explain in as few words as possible what Plasma kind of is a little more. Um, so you mentioned the concept of a, a side chain. Uh, the idea of Plasma is that you can use a smart contract to stake some ETH, for instance, or a token or whatever mechanism for 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 value um, capture there is into the contract and that contract would basically act like you said in the sidechain example as sort of like the lock um, and burn sort of thing but instead of actually burning the assets what it does is it enables you to lock the assets in there trustlessly uh, in the trustless single source of truth main net whatever and then another chain can then inherit the value that is locked in that smart contract. And what that enables is another chain, let's just say another Ethereum chain, for instance, uh, to, to operate on the knowledge that that smart contract up there is locked until proof that of exit is submitted. And that proof of exit can occur within that second layer, layer two plasma chain. And what this enables is that on the main net, we have this huge volume of transactions that are, we're trying to push through. And if we only have one pipe, then we have a limitation on the amount of transactions that can ex be executed. Not everything needs to be executed within the context of the main chain. So the idea behind Plasma was to improve scalability by building a layer two solution on top of the main network, which enables people to hook or stake value into a secondary chain and execute, tr tr uh, you know, auditable long transaction trails um, on a layer two solution within a certain context of that layer two solution. Uh, so for instance, your corporate, uh, I, I'm, this is probably a bad example, but your corporate, um, your corporate transaction mechanism. So internally in your corporation, you might need your own sort of way of, of transferring assets around internally through finances, through budgeting, yada, yada, yada. But you don't want to do all that on the main net. Plus there's a privacy issue involved in that. So why not move it into your own sort of like side chain? Um, uh, because side chains have that vulnerability that you said before, Vitalik would decided to kind of like extend that concept where you don't actually have to burn or, or even remove the asset from the original chain and you don't have to depend on the secondary chain, you can actually use proof mechanisms, cryptographic proof mechanisms to stake in the original chain and exit from the original chain anytime you want, given a certain period. Like you said, it might take days to do a mass exit, for instance. Um, just that's the foundational level here. But the secondary side effect of that is that once you have this layer two chain, it's also inheritable of the properties of the main net. So even though you can stake in the main net, you can also have subchains below that. And this can allow you to create any multitude of layers of chains 
so that you can dissect the transactional throughput deeply instead of going through this one long horizontal pipe of transactions. And I, I know that's a rewind a little bit, but I feel like that, that kind of would clarify it for a certain particular uh, group of our audience. Is that an accurate way of describing what Plasma's goals are? It is accurate. However, I want to insist that the nested tree of chains structure that you, I think that's what you closed up with, it is currently not possible. So creating a plasma chain of a plasma chain in order to further segment and like only have very specific transactions per blockchain, it is currently not possible. And we're not exactly sure if it will ever be possible. So that's interesting. That's one of the main selling points for me on this. And so I was kind of, because I, I just working with particular customers, I know that's kind of a need within their, within their organization, unless we could get like about 2 billion transaction throughput on a single uh, blockchain, it's, it's going to be kind of what they're looking for. So I'm curious, what are the barriers to that? So why do you have to next? You can create multiple plasma chains. So the current limitation, yes, interoperability between plasma chains, we haven't solved it. And it would probably require that you have one smart contract on Ethereum and you have multiple plasma chains and they all speak to the same smart contract. Because what happens is that if you try to make a transaction on one chain from one chain to another, and then you try to exit these funds to try to make a double spend, the other chain must be able to challenge in some way. So each chain must be aware of each other and you would do that with a shared smart contract on chain. However, what I just said, it's totally um, theoretical and as long as there is no either like proper document on it or any implementation, I think that it shouldn't be the actual focusing fo focus. For right now, I assume, but like the reason that I uh, I feel like that's that was actually a big selling point um, is actually privacy, um, and in organization, in, in in organization and interorganizational privacy has been kind of like an issue. And so I saw this as an as as it was proposed a low low hanging fruit solution, but it seems like it's a lot harder than it was you know so, than what was proposed. Uh, so if an organization wants a gatekeeper between exiting funds to the main chain, that would be like your CFO or accounting office or whatever. But they would like to allocate that information to other organizations and within their organization or their consortium of organizations and prevents them from seeing what each other necessarily do, but operate on the only the chain that they care about. I see what you're saying. It would be nice. However, I cannot give you a technical solution to that. that it may, so you need the main point of the nested uh, structure. It is that each, the deepest level, it acts like a court system that as you go up, you get up to the Supreme Court. And effectively, your security is as good as the Supreme Court, the main chains. Uh, that is the whole goal of this. I cannot give you a technical explanation I on think, this because uh, I don't think it exists yet. Yeah, I think I think a, an interesting way to carry this argument forward or the discussion forward that kind of elucidates why or where we can go or what we're currently doing is a, a, a topic that was brought up during the DevCon uh, Plasma discussion uh, a couple of months ago, and that is like, what are the specific like? There, there, it hasn't been any standardized specific requirements of a plasma chain and what it means to be a plasma chain. And I know that you're interested in something like this. Is there any work towards this in terms of like, like formal definitions and requirements of what it means to be a plasma chain and, and mm -hmm. how that operates? So um, 10,000 feet overview, I believe that what qualifies as a plasma chain, as a plasma, let's say, system, it requires one smart contract on Ethereum and a blockchain, or let's say a database, because it doesn't exactly have to be a blockchain, a database, let's say a blockchain, that pings its data back to the main chain. That's it. That, and, and an exit game and an incentive compatible uh, game through which you can take your assets that somehow you got in the plasma chain out back to the main chain. And so... Um, what I tried to do in the last few months is to create a short, sort of more up-to-date plasma paper, which uh, encompasses 
let's say, more uh, in-depth definitions and explaining what is possible, what is not currently, as well as outlining future work so that we can have a more realistic both expectations, because as Colin said, the map reduce and the tree of change was the selling point, but it ended up not being the case. So I believe it's important that we both, uh, let's say, standardize what um, is currently possible and what qualifies something to be a plasma chain. However, we also need to be as realistic as possible and not oversell the capabilities of plasma. All right. And in terms of overselling, let's shit on naming structure. What What's going on with all the different names for different variants of, of, of right, plasma? Right, right, right. So we have Plasma, the original one. We have Plasma MVP. We have Plasma More VP. We're waiting for most viable Plasma. We have Plasma Cash. So Plasma Cash is a version which has unique coins. And because each coin is unique, you can think of it as cash, as physical cash that is unique from each other. Then you have Plasma Cash Flow, which improves on some of the problems of Plasma Cash by fi fixing this uniqueness between coins. And then you have Plasma Prime, which is an addition on Plasma Cash, on Plasma Cash and Plasma Cash Flow, which utilizes a cryptographic technique called RSA accumulators, where the RSA accumulators, they use prime numbers, and this is where the prime comes from. So I totally believe that, and there's also a snark based variants of Plasma, which you call Snap, Snazma, whatever you want. So <laughs> I, I believe that this naming variant, also there was another variant called Plasma XT based on the, it all started as a joke based on Bitcoin forks, but yeah, look where it got us. So um, <laughs> the, um, I believe that the naming convention, it started out okay, but then it got out of control and it has been kind of counterproductive because you will see that you do not need to give your plasma variant a weird name to give it credibility. And so uh, I, I believe that it's very important to classify, to, to have a taxonomy, let's say, of the plasma variants and what they can do. So I will try to abstain from talking about the names and I will talk about the variants and what differentiates them. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So uh, the current variants, how I classify them, they're the ones who are either based on a root chain enforced non-fungibility. So let's like break this down. So a root chain enforced non-fungibility. So when you deposit a coin, you get... So when I deposit... I have five Ether and I, posit, and I stake it. I deposit it, as you said on the smart contract on Ethereum. What this gives me is it gives me a unique coin which is worth exactly five Ether on, pla on the Plasma chain. And if I want to transact, I can only pass that coin around. So the, by root chain, no, by non-fungibility, that's what I'm saying, that it's a unique coin that just has like a solid value. Um, the variant, uh, is that clear? What I mean is that a is that a so you you consider it's basically a non fungible token. It's based... yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay. So you it is a variant where when the the variants where you consider the coins that you deposit as non fungible tokens. And to give that sort of a physical tie in, so people can yeah, manifest yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. It's literally a dollar bill with a serial number on it. You cut exactly. the dollar bill in half, it's a worthless dollar bill. You can't do that. Like it's literally exactly. just that dollar bill. Exactly, exactly. This is the example I was going to use that. You cannot cut it because if you cut it in half, it's a dollar bill is useless. Exactly. The improvement on this variant is that instead of depositing and getting one five ether bill, what I can do is that I deposit five ether and I get 100 0 0.05 ether bills or tokens, if you want. And what I'm doing is that I can make better, like more uh, fungible transactions with, with non fungible coins, like in the real world. We have like multiple coins. We have one uh, euros, like I'm in Europe. So I have, I can give you like five, like multi five euros, five coins of one euro each. And it's the same as five euros. So yes. what you're doing is that you essentially have non-fungible tokens, but you have a fungible UX because you can mm -hmm. essentially, you pay with non-fungible tokens, but you have fungible UX because the denominations of the tokens are pretty small. So uh, is it clear? If I if I could draw an analogy there, it's basically like a conversion rate between euro and say the Icelandic krona, like you or you you can or the U.S. dollar or or China. So in this in the, in this or you know the Canadian dollar, you can you can say, hey, 
this non-fungible token represents the amount of money you've staked in this chain, but you're translating it to another value proposition. Now, are those non-fungible tokens in and of themselves? Yes, they are. So that means that your your the funds, the granularity of your payments, they are it is as good as the smallest uh, token that you own. So if you own five zero point zero one tokens, the the smallest payments that you're making is in increments of zero point zero one. All right. Question from there: How do you transact multiple NFTs in a single transaction? All right. So you can think of it as ranges. So instead of thinking of it as a unique coin, you can think that a bunch of coins that are in a row. So if I have 10 0.01 coins in a row, I can effectively batch transfer them. So uh, technically speaking, a transfer would be start index, comma, offset. And the offset is how many coins I own and I will transfer all in one. Is that assuming you have a serialized like number of coins? Yes, yes. It's assuming you have a bunch of coins in a row. And this is where things tend to get complicated because let's say I have 10 coins in a row and for any reason I, I transfer the middle coin so if we have indexes 0 to 9 let's say I transfer coin 5 to some other user now what happens is that from the point that I had like one continuous range now I fragmented my range in two ranges right and this means that in order to make like to transfer the value that I want I will need to make two transactions uh, thinking about it visually, you can think of it as a number line and the maximum denomination of a payment that you can make is the maximum continuous, uh, uh, let's say, slots that you own in this line. So why does that need to be represented as a non-fungible token in, this, in the plasma chain? Can it just be an iterable number since everything has a, a staked value in the main chain? Can't you just be like, yeah, subtract five from my total? Oh, so you're... Okay, so... Uh, the question is, the question depends on, so this is what you're describing is the account model. Mm -hmm. So uh, to be clear, all Plasma designs uh, currently, what we call Plasma, uh, they are UTXO model based usually. Uh, there, there are other, so okay, to be clear, the variant that I just said, the non-fungible ones, they're in the family of Plasma variants, which are UTXO based. So you have a, a transaction, you have a UTXO with some ID. You have some inputs, you have some outputs. That's it. For account-based plasma, uh, I'm not an expert on this. However, I believe that there are some uh, problems regarding data availability. Because um, in order to make an account model, you need some party basically to keep track of all the balances of all the users. And it gets complicated because you need to make it somehow so that when you're making a payment, the part, the you need to verify that your balance decreased while the other party's balance increased in order to verify that the payment happened or the opposite. And so um, technically speaking, because we rely always on an entity called the operator or the consensus mechanism, but usually to make it simpler to reason about, we talk about the entity as the operator. So the operator has the ability to censor transactions. They can do whatever they want. And it turns out that uh, actually designing an exit game, which is efficient, so it doesn't require uh, exit challenge, 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 like it doesn't require many steps for challenges, it, it's not quite there yet. So there are some variants that are account-based that you can look up on ETH Research, uh, on ETH Research uh, and they would be probably a better point for uh, reference. Because I'm focused on the UTXO based ones. Got you. So I mean, I, I would think a receipt model would probably be better there if they wanted to challenge it. Then it would, you, if you have a central operator whose intent and entire goal is to uh, maintain the truth of the system, then if somebody challenges it, then the operator's res the onus of responsibility would be on the operator to counter that challenge. So they would be the ones responsible for maintaining the proof. Yes, and the point is that in order to maintain the security of the main chain, we need to design a system that does not trust the operator. Because the moment that you start trusting the operator, you're back to the original side change model. Right. Because you but, trust the consensus mechanism. What I'm saying is that if the operator does not submit the proof, then you don't trust the then you you side with the person who contested. Mm. I'm not exactly sure about that. Um, the availability problem would be pushed to the operator. 
Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, so what you're saying is that I can rely to, on the operator for the data availability. Is the is that what correct? You're so I can post yeah. and contest on the main chain anytime I want, but the onus of proof is on the operator. Yes. So get the, you cannot assume data availability from the operator. There are two approaches to this. You either design your system so that the data required is as small as possible so that your client can actually get it once and store it forever or for as long as you need it. So I have a coin and I need to keep the data related to the coin for as long as I own the coin. The moment that I give the coin away, I can discard the data. Fine, that works. This is what we are doing. The alternative is that if the data required is too big, you can add some sort of data availability fraud proof. And I believe that this is also what Ethereum 2.0 is trying to do with uh, fraud proofs. This also may be, I think that Polkadot also does something like this with some fraud proofs. But uh, the point is that if you rely on the operator for fraud proofs, to, for um, data availability, you need to also add a way to punish the operator if they do not provide data availability, right? So, um, and if you add a way, if you add a way to punish the operator for data availability, there is also, the operator may be grift. By grift, I mean they may be attacked in some way that causes them to lose whatever they would lose. Uh, to Basically, if the operator is honest, but people may still attack the operator and make it so that they look dishonest. And uh, this boils down to a problem called, um, what was it? Um, speaker listener fault equivalent. So basically, you cannot say for sure if the other party acted malicious or they simply, so if they are maliciously withholding data or if they are being attacked and they are not able to provide the data. So if I can um, make this more tangible again, um, the operator, let's just say Facebook decides to throw up a plasma chain, okay? Mm -hmm. People hate Facebook. And so they decide that they're going to inundate Facebook with so many transactions and exit contests, contesting, you know, contest, you know, they're going to contest that this, that Facebook is being dishonest, even when they're being completely honest. Now, Facebook can't handle the availability uh, of the number of those, con you know, for whatever reason, um, basically like a DDoS attack, I guess you could say, um, on their system, uh, say by a state actor, who cares, right? Um then Facebook's rating, let's just say they carried in the main chain a karma rating, which would basically say is basically a credit score, would go down if they're not able to fulfill the um, proof required to do it. Furthermore, let's just say their internet goes down because they are all on a let's just say they're on AWS and for some reason AWS decided to, you know, S shit the bed for like half the country. <laughs> Well, then what would you, you know, what are you going to do? They, there's a time frame and, and AWS had a problem and all their stuff was on the cloud. And then suddenly they're, they're, they're not able to uh, prove that they're actually acting uh, honestly. That is an attack on the operator, which would make their karma go down. And there's no way to reverse that. That's is that accurate? accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. That's accurate. Okay, you cool. basically cannot differentiate if the operator is honest or if they're being attacked. Okay, cool. And if that happens, yeah, the operator will not provide the service problem. Got you. So yeah. we can't rely on operators for the availability problem. So let's get back to your taxonomy discussion. Um, that would be an account-based system, but that ha obviously has some flaws. What other kind of uh, systems are Exactly. So uh, I mentioned the root chain enforced uh, non-fungibility, the, non the, the variance with the non-fungible tokens, basically. And basically what we're doing is that we try to fix, try to get fungible UX for this. And uh, the, there's one minor issue with this, with this variant is that in order, because you need to have the full UTXO history when you're making a transaction, the full past. So if I have a coin and I'm giving to you, you need to verify the whole coin's history since it got initially deposited in the plasma chain to make sure that you're not receiving a counterfeit coin. So this history can actually get quite big. And this is where we want to employ some sort of uh, zero knowledge proof in order to make the coin history more compact. And so firstly, we have non-fungible co coins. We add fungible UX to them in order to maintain the security by the non-fungibility, but improve the UX. And finally, we add some sort of 
compression mechanism for the coin's history in order to make it even easier to have a light client. So this is the non-fungible variant. The other variant is what Plasma MVP and more viable Plasma are. They are Plasma UTXO-based Plasma models, which rely on ordering of exits for security. What does this mean? So earlier I said before that the operator can exit the whole value of the Plasma chain. This means that if the Plasma chain has like 10 million Ether in it, the operator can create out of nowhere one huge UTXO and exit that. And how does Plasma, more viable Plasma solve this? What it says is that we order exits based on some priority. And essentially what this means is that honest users, even if they initiate an exit after the malicious exit of the operator, they prove that their exit has higher priority. And this means that when the exits get finalized during settlement, all their exits will happen and they will withdraw their value. And the operator, when they try to finalize their exit, they will not have any value left for them to withdraw. And is that clear? How it would, how you, why do we need the you, ordering? Yeah, I understand the reason for it, but how do you quantify that priority? Right, so the order in Plasma MVP, so there, there are two variants, minimal viable and more viable. In the minimal viable Plasma, the ordering is based on the outputs, on the age of the outputs. Okay, yeah. So if you Older have a UTXO, it's based on the outputs. For more viable Plasma, it's based on the inputs. However, the exit game is a bit more involved, and uh, I think there were some recent developments that I didn't read, read about it. So uh, I would, again, refer you to the document on ETH research, like for, I'm just not saying anything in order to not say anything wrong. But basically, they're ordered based on the input. Are you able to, stick. are you able to, hold on, before, we, before I ask that question, um, are there more variants that we have not gone through yet? Yes. Of course. Let's One more. <laughs> So the final variant of uh, plasmas, so on the UTXO, let's say, based model of plasmas, are the ones which are using zero-knowledge proofs to enforce uh, valid state transitions. So all the ones that I said before, they require challenges. Because if I make an exit, I might as well just transfer a coin to some other user and then exit. And this, my exit needs to be somehow uh, challenged by the new owner of the coin. And this essentially is it's an invalid state transition. So the plasma variants that use snarks, what they do is that they have the operator creates a Merkle tree, a, a snark for the current state, a zero knowledge proof for the current state of the plasma chain, and they submit it to the to this plasma smart contract on chain. And the plasma smart contract it runs. A, a verifier for the zero knowledge proof and it checks that it is a valid state transition from the previous one. How does it do it? It's simply, okay, you can either call it black magic or what it does is that it checks in the snark, it has all this compressed information, that the, that the values, the Merkle tree values, they obey certain rules. So any, ta any kind of uh, transaction that happened, did it have the proper signature on it? And so this variant of Plasma utilizes zero knowledge proofs. It doesn't require challenges. However, it has data availability problems. And they saw this variant of Plasma solves data availability problems by saying that if at any time we lack data availability, we start going back in history. So if we are at block 10 and block 10 is unavailable, we go back to block nine. Is there data available for block nine? No, we go back to block eight and so on, until we find the block that is available. And when we find that block, they make an auction for a new operator because we consider that the current operator who was withholding is malicious. And so the last operator gets dethroned and the new operator comes into play. And this is the final variant of a uh, current plasma designs. I actually kind of got lost towards the middle part of that. Um, <laughs> can you try that one more time? I'm really sorry, but like, that's that's where I I, I, I so yeah, so just... simply speaking, you just validate state transitions on chain without putting all the data required for the state transition on chain, and you do this using the zero knowledge proof. 
because you're 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 creating a succinct proof that the verifier, the smart contract on chain, can check and say that okay, this is a valid state transition. And if it is a valid state transition, it will allow you to go to the next one. Uh, I get it. Yes. And if there is a data availability problem, you just keep rolling, rolling up. You go back in time until there is data available. That's it. So who would be submitting that 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 to the chain? Would it like oh, what... the operator, the current operator? Oh, so th- it's their their responsibility to check in, basically. Yes, exactly. If the operator does not, oh yeah, this is a design requirement in all plasma design. The operator always submits the right. Merkle root yeah. of their latest block, always. So that's another question that I have about the plasma design. Who pays for that? The operator. It's part of their business model. Gotcha. So a good way to think about this is that the operator obviously will will require fees from the users. These fees, they do not have to be in the protocol. The operator can be, I don't know, Netflix and say that if you pay me $5 per month, I will put your transactions on Plasma. I will allow you to transact on Plasma. So a good mental model is to think that on Plasma, you get censored by default unless you pay whatever you want, whatever the operator asks you for in order to include your transactions. This is like in the total adversarial mindset, what would happen. So the default, because the operator, they can simply choose, do I include or not this guy's transactions? And so, Yes, got it, go ahead. Yeah, and uh, the fees, they get paid out of the protocol. The thing is that the costs for putting the Merkle root on chain, they can stack up. Yeah. So it's to put one word on uh, the main chain, it's 20,000 gas. Maybe you want to put two words per submit block. So maybe it's like around 40 or 60,000 gas. And if you do this every 15 seconds for a year, this is maybe, depending on the price of Ether, this can be maybe 100,000, maybe 1,000 if Ether goes to zero. Who knows? The thing is that um, the, the operational costs for the operator, they, they stack up. And so yeah. it is the responsibility of the operator to choose an appropriate fee model in order to offset their costs. So, all right. So, yeah, I get that. That makes perfect sense to me. Um, what I'm still kind of caught up on in the ZK Snark model is that they submit it to the, they submit a proof of the current state to the chain. So they're basically like, yeah, this is a valid state. But that doesn't necessarily prove that the operator is being honest to all people participating in their plasma chain, correct? Oh, it is. It is because, because, because they can deny if... certain transactions. For whatever oh, reason. Okay, so so okay, you're correct. So plasma does not have any kind of censorship guarantee. If the operator wants to censor you, they will censor you, and you will never be able to make a transaction. However, you can always exit. So the whole point is that even if you get censored, you can get your money out and you will never touch that operator again. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, and, and honestly, that's kind of the way the world works anyway, you know. Yeah. You can join Twitter, but if Twitter says your account's gone, then your account's gone, right? Like, and the, these these plasma chains, and this is important for our audience to understand, they're not this. They're layer two solutions. They're not supposed to be as public to the degree that, say, the you know Ethereum is, in which it's open participatory model where anybody can kind of you know do whatever you know do anything by the rules. You're free to to do anything in the that's, censorship proof. That's what I wanted to ask. This is not that. That's 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 what I wanted to make sure that I kind of asked is like what are like the the fundamental trade offs of a plasma chain because like it's clearly not the as generalized and fair and trustless as the base chain so in order to go to that layer two you make some trade offs are there fundamental yeah. trade offs or do you get to kind of pick and choose based on how you operate right so let's take them one by one so firstly censorship resistance none. There is no, or rather not none, it's as good as the operator wants, can potentially be none. However, getting your funds in perfectly, you get them in. And in order to maintain security of your funds, you need to obey and challenge and stuff. This is the same as any type of layer two solution, because you need to maintain some local proofs about what happens in the side chain, in the plasma chain, in the payment channel, if you want, like whatever. So that if something goes wrong, you challenge. The same thing happens in Lightning Network. 
you need to be online every every so often so that um, you can challenge if somebody tries to get your money out or tries to steal your money. So there is zero compromise on the security of your funds as long as you follow the rules. The rules are that you log in every so much time and you check, are my funds okay? Fine. Is there something that I need to do? I challenge. Two, there is that. Three, the transaction throughput that you get, it is limited by the operator. This can be assumed that if an operator becomes big enough, they can route an arbitrary amount of transactions. The fees that you pay, they also depend on the operator. If the operator decides to give you free fees, fine, you're good. If not, sure, you, you will, again, you will exit. The thing is that you pick your own operator based on the services. And, the, and what happens is that usually what I'm guessing will happen, what we do, is that you will create a plasma chain. The plasma chain will be part of a bigger, let's say, scheme. So in our case, you can essentially like get some funds in the plasma chain and use this to, let's say, buy some booster pack for your card game or buy a card or sell a card. So it is, it is not strictly just like for, you, you, you can, how do you say, like, you should not assume the most, it, it will not always be the most adversarial environment, but even if it is, you're still safe. But if it's not, if you're optimistic about the security of the environment, things will be super smooth. And that is the whole goal. So uh, let me, let me, so I'm sure this has been asked within the community before, uh, but let me, let me theory craft for a second. Um, what about an operatorless plasma chain where everybody regist who registers and stakes is suddenly a validator on the network and a and submitted to a what is essentially a Randau contract to make them responsible for you know um, the, you know the, you know, submitting proof that the chain state history has been updated properly. Fine, do it. What do you win? You do not gain something really, though. Well, do you? You gain, uh, you gain computational overhead, you gain the delay from the rundown, censorship resistance, you say? Yeah, I think it would be more censorship resistant. Why, not use, why not use the base layer then? Because the base layer has a transactional uh, cost that's tied to Ethereum, and this would have a transactional cost which is tied to the plasma chain. I, I I still believe that it's better to use the Ethereum chain, so or the whatever like base layer. I would I would even go as far as say use Bitcoin in order to get the most censorship resistance. There's like a spectrum here, right? So you need to optimize for whatever you need. And the thing is that no operator will bother censoring your uh, trade of a simple like tra gaming card uh, operation. If you're if you're transacting if you're transacting one million ether, which is an operation which may be good to censor, why are you even transacting that type of amount on the plasma chain? So I'm assuming that plasma chains or any type of layer two solution, it's not really for like all the huge amounts of transfers that you need them to be censorship resistant. Maybe maybe that's a bit hand wavy, if you will, but uh, I I can live with that. Yeah, I got you. And I understand, like, if, if you're building a value proposition against a card trading game, and, and which is a great example, or CryptoKitties, another decent example, um, you know, then why would you want to harm your network by, by basically censoring people who are um, just trying to do regular normal transactions on the network? Uh, that stuff will be evident to the network, I would assume, in some way. So would everybody be able to see the transactions that, in theory... I guess that would be up to the operator whether or not their rules allow for that so that people can know if, if there's censorship going on or like I, this is this is the kind of thing where I, I could see there possibly being a business case where you don't like your competitor using your system. So you start censoring them and people would want to know that you're doing that. Yeah, definitely. And also you can, you can always expect that. So we're always trying to optimize for light clients, but you can also assume that there will be nodes which have the same storage as the operator but do not have but do not have right access to the blockchain so you can assume that there will be data availability providers i am very confident that there will be data availability providers giving you access to the data so that you know if somebody is being censored or not gotcha and then there there'd be 
probably third party systems out there just to just to monitor that sort of stuff yeah, and exactly. report on it and that would be its own business model in and of itself. Exactly. But always we must design so that is the important part. We must design the system so that it works without them. And if it works without them, then fine. Maybe people will build them build them. But you can never assume that people that this mechanism will exist. So what happens in the event that the operator loses data availability? Is that force a mass exit or is that up to the, the choice of the, the contract so, that you staked in? So if the operator doesn't provide data availability, you check your local storage. If you do not have the medical proofs, the proof required to do any action on you, yeah, you're done. Because you always must maintain the proofs required to prove ownership of your data, if you want. So it is essentially like running a full node just for the coins that you own. But nobody else, let's say, has info about these coins. So uh, if you lose this data, nobody else has it. Gotcha. Okay. That is that is the most adversarial case. But again, I'm pretty confident that there will be, let's say, like... So it, to be clear, the current implementation that I have you anytime that you download uh, that you get a coin it caches all the medical proofs required for it locally anytime a new block comes it gets again the data so even if the operator dies you can still you always have all the data required so this must be part of your implementation um, gotcha. yeah see well, yeah so basically you could just throw up your own operator technically and say hey i'm completely forking this crypto kitties and creating my own crypto kitty absolutely absolutely yes well, that actually uh, well, kind of makes it interesting you can, in that it, it, it actually diminishes the value proposition for being an operator, doesn't it? Well, no, you cannot actually do that because currently, currently, if uh, on, on an implementation level, you specify one address that allows you to, uh, to deposit and to, uh, to update the state of the contract to do, submit the blocks. That is the operator. To go to a multi-operator model, you would need to alter it. And I don't think it actually eliminates the value proposition. It even makes the operator that exists more uh, rigorous because they're, they're gaining money through fees. Let's assume. So let's assume that the operator is gaining money through fees. Um, if they know that there's somebody else who is ready to take their spot and take away their sweet fees, um, they will at any time. They will even try, try even harder to be a good operator. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I, and yeah, so you, you want to do the capture. That's it. So it's basically just the same model we have now, except we're extending it so that we can have the truth mechanisms on main chain back the models we have now with typical web apps, um, and without having all the transactions necessarily go through the pipe of a web app. Uh, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. It's local um, consensus, essentially. Yeah. You have localized consensus on each chain. Mm -hmm. And uh, whenever you want to interoperate, you go back to the global I've one. always I've always viewed this as intranets to the, the wider internet, the main chain being the internet, each of these plasma chains being an intranet, much yeah. like you have your local, you know, your local DHCP handing out IPs for the one you receive from your ISP. Totally. It's it's a similar type model in terms of trust. Take that analogy, what is the internet of Loom? Like what like what are you making? Why, how is Loom using this and, and, and building on it? Why do you need it? Right. So uh, the Plasma is currently used by Loom for... Uh, uh, we have a battleground game, a zombie battleground, but we call it a card game uh, that you can... Uh, it's a trading card game on a that you play on your mobile device or your computer. And the difference is that we have a marketplace and the whole game runs on a blockchain. So the game doesn't run though, on Ethereum mainnet, it runs on what we call a DAP chain. It's a side chain for a DAP. And uh, what it does is that there are two ways to deposit. So let's say you have a crypto zombie on mainnet um, and you want to play with it on the DAP chain. What you do, there are two ways to deposit it. You either deposit it as viewing the DAP chain as an usual side chain. So you trust the side chain's consensus or you can deposit through Plasma. So the, the whole thing is that we allow users to have to pick their poison, basically. They either go with the normal consensus mechanism, which is DPoS, which gives you some fault tolerance, 34% fault, like 34 uh, dishonest 
uh, uh, dishonest uh, fault. Oh, let me rephrase. Uh, you can either deposit via what we call a transfer gateway. So you deposit your funds and then their funds are in the side chain and they are controlled by DPoS. Or you can deposit through Plasma and your, pl and your funds are protected via Plasma. And this allows users to basically pick their own security. So you can either deposit through DPoS and you can enjoy the DPoS and fast transactions and no, let's say, um, no bookkeeping on your end. There is no need to watch out for challenges, exits, no malicious operators or whatever. But um, but if the if the chain holds for whatever reason, your funds are stuck, which, is, which can be bad if you do not uh, if you're not careful. So we provide users with the alternative to deposit via plasma, so that even if their funds, even if the side chain goes uh, bad, they can still take their funds out. However, there is the trade-off that they still need to do some more bookkeeping, like keep their proofs, keep their challenges, do challenges, and so on. And I believe that it's good that we allow both ways, because always the thing is that you need to provide the most secure alternative, but you also need to provide good UX. It's a certainly a hard problem to solve, and I I, I don't know. I've I've always loved kind of the following these guys based on. I mean, y'all got a lot of um, clout slash um, awareness traction. during the traction during y'all's the educational guides for writing smart contracts and the crypto crypto zombies, zombies baby. I, that was basically the de facto standard yeah. of sending people to learn things, and that was a really smart move on y'all's part. Yeah, uh, and then the movement for actually building out this layer two technology in a lot of well, helping build out this layer two technology in a lot of ways to enable new business use cases so that we have better web apps dealing with value has, has been, I don't know. I've, I've always appreciated the stuff y'all are doing. So bravo to so all George, of that. I, I could tell you, I could talk for, with you for hours probably about plasma still, but uh, you know, we do have to wrap up, but I, I, I kind of like a use case that keeps popping up in my world. Um, you know, uh, a lot. And I, I'm not sure if Plasma is actually the right solution for it. And I was kind of hoping maybe you could chime in. Go on. Arbitrary check-ins. So if I wanted to do off-chain off Plasma transfers uh, for something that disconnects from the internet entirely for an arbitrary period of time, and then is able to rejoin the network and check in its value exchange, is that even something that you would suggest Plasma being useful for? So, um, can you rephrase it? Can you like show the use case one more time? What is sure. your mindset? Uh, just you? black box, uh, black box. Uh, 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 let's just say you have a series of black boxes, okay? And these black boxes can hop on and off the grid. Um, okay. Meaning that they can they can lose connectivity, and that's by design. Um, and then you want to you want them to basically interact with each other. Um, at will. What are they interacting with? Uh... Uh, any value add transfer. So it could be serialized yeah. assets, you know, anything like that. Okay. Um, and and they want to basically verify that each one is kind of operating truthfully, kind of like a localized consensus. So I kind of envision them all being on a plasma chain, um, the same plasma chain, mind you, or several same plasma chains, um, so that they could verify that that when they bump into each other, they're all operating on, uh, they're all operating truthfully, and they can all sort of like exchange assets in a localized manner, and then hop back on the network when they get connectivity again. Now, I know that that's that's kind of an abstract case, and I can't get into too many details about that. But like, are plasma chains going to work with arbitrary like offline time periods? So, if you have an operator, which is the one that's doing the check-ins, is it is it is it possible that something can be offline for a time period and then decide to hop back on? Or do you need to put a regular check-in period for anything that's going to be you know, sending a proof of exchange to the plasma chain? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure if this will answer exactly your use case question, but the thing is that in plasma, you always, like in any layer two solution, you always need to come online every time you have a dispute period. So if you have a channel open and uh, some dispute happens, you need to count that dispute within a certain amount of days. The same apl applies for Plasma. So if you have some assets on the Plasma chain and you go offline and you go offline for longer than the dispute period, um, you potentially may lose your asset because it is possible, it can be the case that the operator 
or some other party colluding with the operator attempts to exit your funds, your tokenized asset, whatever, and you should come before you should come online before the exit period, before the dispute period to challenge them. If you do not come online challenge, you're done. So yeah. there needs to be a way to not have a very strict liveness requirement. So there is a liveness requirement is the answer. And the liveness requirement, we can probably uh, either solve it by setting a high uh, dispute period. So if we have a dispute period, which is once a year, for example, we can assume that somebody will log in once a year and check if things are good. In the alternative case, what we can do is that we can delegate challenging. So we can have a watchtower so that your node goes offline for arbitrary amounts of time, but you have hired some other party to challenge for you. Does this make sense? Yeah. So basically you can, you can have somebody go, okay, I know this node's offline. I'm going to go ahead and extend its dispute period on its behalf because I have external worldly knowledge that this this node will come back online at some at some point. It just had it's, it, it's not an extended the, trip. It's not extending the challenge period. It is literally guaranteeing that while the node is offline, if any challenge happens, if any malicious action happens, I will take care of it. Got you. Okay, I got you. Okay. Hmm. Um, my one other question, and this is kind of like not necessarily exactly in your wheelhouse is I think our audience would like to know a differentiation between general state channels and plasma. So if you could, if you could briefly. I love this. Okay. Okay. So (laughs) plasma currently does payments, payments and only payments. And by payments, I mean a transfer of a tokenized asset. So the tokenized asset, I don't care. It can be whatever, as long as it has some sort of way to express its uh, how you move it around. Because what happens is that generalized plasma cannot exactly exist because I cannot really have some state of a of a what do you of a chess game and exit it. An exit is explicitly um, an attestation that I want to withdraw some value. And that value can be anything that is tokenized. However, in order to do state channels or rather do generalized plasma and smart contracts on plasma i believe that state channels and plasma itself are complementary so this is actually what we'll be working i what is going to be my focus in the next few months is that we can make we can initialize a state channel with a deposit from plasma so let's say that i already put my funds on plasma and i'm transacting with them and then I find, I open a state channel from Plasma, and when I want, I do whatever I want in the state channel. I play some chess or whatever. And when I close the state channel, the funds that were bet in the chess, they go back into Plasma. So essentially, it's not like layer one, two, three. It's more like layer one, main chain, and you have layer two, Plasma and state channels, and they speak to each other. That's awesome. And that's probably where... <laughs> I'm glad you're working on that. That's all I got to say. <laughs> yeah, and the other alternative, it would be to do EVM on Plasma, what they call EVM in EVM, which is quite complicated. And in the end, it achieves the same goal because essentially you're funding a smart contract from some state of Plasma and you're settling some value back to Plasma based on what happened in the smart contract. Even if you do it on a smart contract in Plasma or if you do it on a smart contract that was executed through a state channel, it is the same thing. What you're caring is about the result, not how it happened. And I claim that the way to do it in the, with the state channel is it's simpler to do than with uh, EVM in EVM. That's great. And and yeah, I, I, I just want to point something out. Uh, the, the purpose of this research is, is not to uh, necessarily... Um, solve all the problems, but to provide the community with a greater tool set of solutions to solve the architecture issues surrounding mm-hmm. building decentralization. Building blocks, building blocks. Right. And so what's interesting to me is you created this taxonomy of types of plasma chains and each one has a niche use case in its own pluses and minuses. And just like when you're building scalable architecture 
on a data center or building scalable solutions in software, you're building scalable architectures in consensus and I and, and value asset transfer. And I feel like this is the paradigm shift that the community should be looking at because I, I, while I do believe that layer one scaling is, is something that needs to happen and things like, be, you know, I don't want to call it beacon chain anymore. What is it called? Um, serenity. Serenity. Like what, what yeah. serenity is doing is, is, is widening <laughs> a single pipe. That's like, that's like laying pipe in. Okay. To... I will give a very contrary opinion now. So, okay. Um, okay. Maybe so sharding I've, I've called it layer two in the past. Because layer one is the beacon chain and layer two is each shard chain at, attached to the beacon chain. But we lately came to an agreement that you can call the layer, the beacon chain, you can call it like layer zero. The, yeah. the shard chains are layer one and each plasma chain or channels that are attached on each shard, that is the layer two. I agree with yeah. that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, yeah. But the, the, the layer zero is the, the beacon of randomness. Is basically yeah, exactly. it's it's, well, the, it's, it's not only the beacon of randomness. It also the does coordinator all the of slash validators chain. and slash. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. essentially, it's very similar to the sidechain model because if so in the plasma model, yeah. because in plasma, if the layer one gets compromised, plasma is also compromised because you cannot also uh, do reliable uh, challenges and exits. So Same to go way, back to my... go ahead, yeah, please. To go back to my previous like question, can we yes, have sorry. a operatorless, you know, uh, plasma chain? That's what shards are. Yeah, right? that's what I'm saying essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. That, yeah, okay, that makes perfect sense, and I, I like the whole layer zero approach because first off, we count at zero in computer science. Um, that and, depends on your language. <laughs> uh, Matlab, Matlab. You should count at zero <laughs> in computer science, uh, but uh, but you know, it's um. Uh, it, it it just it, it's it that's what I was really like, kind of like asking I guess there is shard chains are the the whole operatorless you know side chain solution whereas uh, you know this isn't a layer two solution I mean you need to add, inject an element of sort of like trustiness not trustlessness but trustiness meaning that you got to have this kind of like in between state of trust non trust where there's enough checks and balances in to to secure yourself properly so you know your value won't be lost but you also still are dependent on the availability of another and the and the and the um, uh, i don't want to call it uh the the truthfulness i guess of a our truthiness. censorship is yeah truthiness of a, of a of an operator um and it's kind of like this kind of like gray area this 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 superposition of trust versus non-trust um and so i, I just uh i i think uh, i think that that's a good good approach um, As yeah, always, I want to I, I want to wrap this up with one last question, and that is like, what is there something that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get around to asking? Oh, uh, the main thing that I wanted to talk about was how bad the plasma naming is, and uh, I believe we got into it a bit. So yeah, yeah. Well, you didn't get to like properly <laughs> shit on it. You like kind of danced around it. So well, I see plasma need need being need a umbrella. Need to respect everybody's work because honestly, everybody's putting so much work on this. And uh, yeah, much love and respect and everything. Like, oh, there's no, there's no the shame on like people's okay, work. As long as yeah. good things get built. The, the yeah, it's work, surprising it's how awesome. quickly I got confused, confused by all the naming myself. And like, yeah, originally when I read the white paper, it was very clear, like this is the direction we're going. And then there's all these variants of it, and I'm like, I can't keep track of this. And do like, well, wait. you can definitely not keep track of the white paper plasma, so it's better to have it like this way right now. It's also, like, I mean, <laughs> if you want to learn more about it, like Coral Flourish has created those those videos online to help. I can uh, set those. Uh, up. Let me steal my work right here. Yeah. So I I wrote something I call the plasma paper, plasma cache. So it's a paper on plasma cache, and uh, it essentially describes what it is, what its limitations are, uh, how we how the challenges work, how the exits work. And uh, yeah, it's a good read for every anybody who wants to do like a full uh, reading on what plasma is. That will be in it's the show right notes. Totally it's a totally up to date like version. Yeah, I just send it in the chat. Perfect. Uh, all right. So, how do people reach out? What do people what do people do to get? So hold you of? can find me on Twitter at g a k o n s t, and yeah, Twitter is good. All right. <laughs> I like it. So do I. <laughs> You're also at g g a k. O N S T dot com too. Yeah, also. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Yeah. All right. Thank so, you so l- much. listeners, uh, right. if you liked it, subscribe, hit the button, tell your friends, 
Uh, share it with everybody you know, and uh, we'll see you next week. And definitely check out what the Loom guys are doing. They got some interesting stuff over there. Yeah.